Alrighty, hi all. So I've got another video for you here today um, that's going to look specifically at, as it says on the bottom of the screen there, unpicking tragedy. We want to be thinking about what it means for a text to be tragic, why that's significant, what the different layers of tragedy are, what the different things that make a text tragic truly are. And of course, we're going to be looking at that through the lens of the poetry of John Keats, the four poems that you see on your screen, the Eve of St. Agnes, Isabella of the Pot of Basil, the Belle of Sans Merci, and Lamia. Now, I'm going to specifically touch on Isabella um, for most of this presentation. Um, they're not going to be a ton of ideas in terms of actually going through the entire poem, but I'm going to give you a few things to question in terms of thinking about the unpicking of tragedy. But in order to do that, first we need to start off with this idea of a working definition of tragedy. Um, at the top of your screen, you'll see the online etymology dictionary. This is a free resource that you can access online. It's very, very handy um, as it, it states in its title. Obviously, it involves or involves the etymology of words. So you go to this dictionary online, you type in a word, and it essentially gives you the historic background behind the word, the different meanings that that word's had throughout time. And that's quite interesting to note because often the meaning of words changes over time. And I'm going to point out a couple of specific examples to you later in this presentation um, that come from Isabella that I think lend themselves well to interpreting actually perhaps there's a very significant tragic nature to this poem. Uh, but we'll get to those in a second. So you've got the definition of tragedy in front of you there. It is or has been from the late 14th century a play or other serious literary work with an unhappy ending. All right, so if we go with that definition, if we use the idea that this is what tragedy is, okay? Um, and if you look at the bottom there from about 1500, it was any unhappy event or disaster. Then, essentially, for each poem, we've got to determine how the ending of each of these is unhappy. So as you go back and reread, I think you should query that and say, okay, so at the end, where are the characters? What's the setting, right? What's the unhappy outcome that essentially we're left with? Is it clear? Is it obvious? If you look at La Belle Dame Sans Merci, for instance, right, we know that poem's got a cyclical structure to it. So it actually starts at the end. Right, And we go through this, this story, the knight tells us his story, and we arrive back at the end where he's alone and palely loitering. Right, So consider, as you're reading each of these, how is the ending of each of them unhappy? Okay, So we ask ourselves, what's actually tragic about each of these poems? Okay? Um, I'll use the example of Macbeth. Macbeth is a fairly simple one. Many of you will study that at GCSE. Um, You've got this character who starts off in everyone's good graces. He's well respected. He's on a trajectory where he's doing really, really well in life, right? He gets told these predictions or these prophecies and essentially takes matters into his own hands, acts really poorly, and ultimately loses everything. Very, very simply, that's what's actually tragic about Macbeth, right? Now, if we jump forward to these texts, you've got to think about, for the A level anyhow, um, this idea of interpretation, as you'll see on the screen, it's not fixed, it's never fixed, okay? And as you read it, and the more that you read it, that the meaning that you find will be shaped and it will be shaped differently. It's gonna change. Right? So as you're reading and rereading, I want you to consider that more and more. Right, What is actually in front of your face and how can you interpret it? It's not just what I say something is. It's not just what the revision guide says it is. You know, It's not even what some other um, revision video that you find online says about these poems. We really want you to be looking at them and trying to discern meaning out of what's put in front of you and really sort of closely analyze these texts and consider what you think could be there. But then, of course, justify that, right? Now, with that, okay, the A-level is really about enjoyment and interpretation. I've said that before many times in lesson. You are meant to enjoy these texts and you are meant to interpret them. A part of that, too, as you'll see, is challenging those ideas, as I've just said. We want you to challenge these things. We want you to be critical. So I've got two sort of starter questions for you, if you will. Um, Looking at nuances is key, right? Right at the very start of the Eve of St. Agnes, we're told that there's bitter chill, right? That doesn't seem particularly pleasant. Does that make us tragic? Is that poem destined to be tragic because of that, the way that the setting is established there? Is that it? 
I don't think it is. There's plenty more that goes on. But then if we think about that chilly setting at the start, when we're left with the moors at the end of the poem, that chill is still there. So is there something in that presentation of the setting that actually maybe gives us a bit of a clue into the idea that, yes, this is definitely going to be a tragic poem? Okay? And then secondly, and that's the question that I'm going to address slightly later in this, in this video, um, but how are Lorenzo and Isabella presented to us as tragic characters? If you look at the very, very opening, the first two lines are entirely about them, and I'm going to have a look at them with you in a second. So we've got this poem. I'm going to suggest four interpretations to you. The first being that this poem's just about a young woman losing her lover. That's it, right? That's the tragedy. A young woman, she loses her lover. That's it, okay? Secondly, could it be that this poem's actually about Lorenzo, right? It's about a young man. He doesn't really recognize his own situation. He doesn't read social cues properly. As a result of that, he's murdered, and that's the tragedy, right? That a young man is murdered, okay? Obviously, there are tragic elements connected to Isabella, but is it mostly about him, okay? The third interpretation that I put to you is about the brothers, and the brothers are the focus of this poem, okay? It's all about class for them, right? We know that the, the frequently, right, it's repeated, why were they proud? It's speaking about class and status. And actually, class and status, if you think about Macbeth again, perhaps, um, they drive people to doing very, very foolish things, right? So... Is the poem about them and actually their fall from greatness as a result of their actions? That could be one of the tragic elements, at least, of the poem. Okay? And then finally, the fourth that I put to you is, is this poem just about a woman and her obsession? Right? Is there this sort of typical feminine character who's maybe um, not particularly intelligent, who's sort of almost that, um, you know, the dangerous seductress character that we see ar archetypally in many, many stories? And actually... Because she's so obsessive, because she's sort of so lustful for this um, for this lover of hers, and she can't ever actually achieve him, um, ultimately she becomes insane and she, she dies heartbroken, right? So I question, which one of the four is it? And I want you to think, is it any of the four? Is it perhaps a combination of these four different ideas? Or is there a fifth or sixth interpretation that I've not even touched on, right? I've come up with these four fairly quickly, um, and I think you could make the argument for any one of them. Um, you'd have to dig quite a bit, but I do think also it's worth noting just, you know, which one is it? Could it be any one of them, or is it a combination of them, or is there something else that I've just missed entirely? And I leave that to you, and I do put that question to you. That can be one of the things in your rereading of this poem, perhaps looking for these to justify one of, the, one of each of those four, or to find an additional one, right? Now, when we're looking at tragedy... I think that clues towards this can be found in the different types of imagery that we're looking at. The actual setting, the color, the nature, the mythology that Keats is using. He uses tons of mythology. And if you go and sort of read some of the backstories of these, there's a lot of heavy stuff in there. So make sure you are looking those references up and really trying to understand what's going on with them. Okay? The characterization is important, how the characters are established. The next uh, slide in this video, we're going to look at Isabella and Lorenzo in particular. Then you've got symbolism, too. Right? There are symbols found all throughout literature, but what actually are they, right? What does um, the pot of basil become a symbol for? Is it a symbol of her love? Is it a symbol of loss? Is it a symbol of obsession? Okay, All of those key towards or, or point towards different elements of tragedy, different layers of tragedy. Okay, Think about voice as well. Who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? Who's being heard? Who's not being heard or not being listened to? Okay? And then structure as well. Think about the way that the poems are built and established. Think about everything combined, the settings, the characters within those settings, right? How are those significant? And how, are, how do they maybe come across as tragic? Okay? Now, many of my students like to focus on specific single words, okay? And they like to use the phrase that many critics might argue. And I want to, again, remind you this is about interpretation. Okay? You can start with a single word, but you don't want to solely write about a single word. Right? You want to come up with your own interpretation of what's been put in front of you about the larger ideas. Okay? You want to write about those things. So I'm going to give you an example of how these can point you in the right direction um, in just a second. Okay? But remember that it's about interpretation. So coming up with an idea or a main point that you're going to make and then writing about an alternative to that is much more useful than saying many critics might argue or some critics might say, right? 
that's other people's ideas. You want to be writing clearly about your own ideas. So we start with the first line of Isabel, a fair Isabel, poor, simple Isabel. Now I've used the online etymology dictionary again for this fantastic resource, free to use. You don't have to sign up, anything like that. Please do make use of it. Now, if we look at the word simple there, right? Um, you'll notice that it's got quite an extensive definition, which means it's, it's changed quite a bit as time's gone on. And if we look at the very, the top bit, right? At first, it suggests that there's this idea of simple simplicity being linked to ignorance, un, being uneducated, being unsophisticated, being simple-minded or foolish. And that changes, right? You get this free from pride, being humble or meek in the mid 13th century, okay? Unqualified the mid 14th century. But then if we jump to from the 1500s or so, there's this idea of being ignorant. If you're simple, you are ignorant. And I think that's quite important. If Isabella is, re is referred to as simple, then she is ignorant. Perhaps she's ignorant of the actual implications of the actions, the implications of her relationship with Lorenzo and her involvement with him. Perhaps she's ignorant of her brother's actual ideas and the stresses and pressures that are placed on them. All of those could link to tragedy. Right? So do think about that as a, as a possible interpretation. Again, I say possible interpretation, but I think it is worthy of your time. We look at the second line too. Um, it suggests that Lorenzo, a young Palmer in love's eye, and I want to go for the, um, the etymology of Palmer there, right? This idea that a Palmer is an itinerant monk going from shrine to shrine under a perpetual vow of poverty. Now, we know what monks are itinerant, right? They're traveling. Um, but that second part of the definition is very, very interesting to me. This idea of a perpetual vow of poverty. If it's a perpetual vow of poverty, that means that the character's always going to have that poverty, which means that Lorenzo is always going to suffer poverty from love. He's never actually, it's never actually going to be satisfied. He's never going to achieve it, right? So in the, in the first instance, when we look on the surface of this idea that he's a palmer, right? He's someone, perhaps he's a pilgrim. He's going on this journey to try and achieve love. Great, that's the service level interpretation. But then when you dig a little bit deeper, the etymology, it's, it goes a little bit darker, right? Hang on a second. Actually, there's something tragic about that to me. It suggests that he's never going to achieve it no matter what, which to me says, actually, yeah, this is tragic right from the start of the poem, okay? So we've got to think about how Keats is characterizing these characters. How does this set the stage for tragedy? Right away, just based on the first two lines, that says to me, She's ignorant. He's never actually going to achieve this love. So this seems like it's a relationship that's doomed from the start. And that's worth considering. Okay, that's definitely worth considering. Now, to dig a little deeper into their relationship, remember this poem's got 63 stanzas. It's a long poem. There's a lot there. The first 13 are entirely devoted to establishing the relationship and the setting and the context in which they exist. Okay. Um, it seems like the time of year, it's May time, June time, it's time of life, of growth, but their days are honeyless. There's no fruit from the days that they actually spend together. So they don't seem to be positive. They don't seem to be in a good state. And that, of course, can link to what I've previously said about those first words that we're introduced to. Everything about their relationship and interaction is very tentative. It's very hesitant. There's no oomph to their relationship. Neither of them takes action, okay? When Lorenzo finally does speak, right, He's got timid lips and they grow bold. So is that the moment, line 69 there, where he crosses the line into tragedy? He goes beyond his station. He actually enacts some type of negative interaction that, that shows that actually she remains ignorant, that he's trying to step beyond the bounds of not being worthy of love. Right? So those are all worthy of consideration. Again, look for those specific words. Think about what they might mean and how they might mean. Are there different interpretations that we can have from those words? Okay. So again, ask the question, what's actually tragic? Always worth asking. Okay. And I've got a couple more questions for you. Who are the characters? What's significant about them? The male characters, the female characters, right? Have we got any archetypal characters being presented to us? Okay. What's the setting? What's significant about it? Where are these things taking place? Okay. That can definitely be significant. You think of the cold hillside. I mean, that should set off a couple red flags for us right away. How do things happen? Right? Are they quite calm? Is there a lot of action or are they sort of, are, do they seem destined by fate? Is the supernatural involved? Okay. What are the outcomes of the different actions? And finally, what's the tragedy?